radio check, radio check, radio check. This is the Explorer's pod over. Four, three, right. two, one. Luke, what's up, buddy? How's it going, Todd? Nice Good, to meet man. you. Yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> Where are you at right now? I'm visiting my parents in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, on the East Coast. Far so, out. And I go back oh. to the Tetons in Wyoming on Monday. So Okay, so you're enjoying a little of the holidays with the fam. Absolutely. Cool. <laughs> yeah. How does it feel to be back home? It's good. Yeah, it's good to catch up with some friends here, socially distanced, and uh, see my folks. And interesting times with COVID and all, for sure. Oh, so, makes it makes it hard for free spirits like us huh yeah yeah it's uh yeah it's been good yeah so you guys live on a boat that's really cool i've Um, been how long have you been doing that oh god i took off when i was 20 26 (laughs) years old i took off to sail around the world so i've been living on boats half my life really i was uh pretty full on into climbing i was living in yosemite and came home from Yosemite I had a girlfriend in Vancouver and I was living in Bellingham and I was like where am I gonna live dude I've been living in tents out of the back of my car and uh-huh. and I was, went and looked at all these rooms and they were all just white stark rooms no furniture and I just couldn't imagine my tent in there and a sleeping bag and yeah. I found this little boat down in the harbor for like three thousand dollars and I offered to make payments on it and boom that's how it all started it's awesome yeah wow. Yeah, well, I kind of like uh, told him a little bit that we're in a floating home right now. So. Yeah, so yeah. we just, we spent a year, we just tried to uh, kind of reinvent our life again. And last year we, we built this house that we're in right now. It's a floating home and it's totally off the grid. And we're, uh, yeah, it's pretty 100% carbon neutral. We got water maker and then um, waste treatment uh, center for everything. And yeah, it's pretty solar cool. Solar panel, yeah. Awesome. What's the name of the boat? Or well, the home, the home yeah, the is actually has a name and it's called a Mihan star, which means uh, cool northeast wind. Yeah. The name of oh. our daughter. Yeah. <laughs> it's the name of our daughter. Yeah. Oh, wow. Cool. Okay. Very yeah. cool. So, hey, dude, we're just going to roll with it. We're rolling. We're recording yeah, right now. Nice to meet you. <laughs> you guys. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Cool. All right. So you're you're back home and you're going to head back to the Tetons. Are you there for a while now with the COVID thing? So is it kind of shut you down in the Himalayas for a bit and you're spending your time back in the Tetons? Yeah, I, I have a home and I have a house in the Tetons now um, for a couple of years now. And it's, it's really home base here in the U.S. just because of the vertical relief of the Tetons. Yep. So it's just great to go out and from the parking lot get you know six thousand feet of vert <clears throat> so it's it's really good prep for the himalayas that's what really attracted me to the tetons and just also the the snowpack there is consistently good at the start of the season so for a while i would start the season in the tetons and then go over to Kashmir in the western himalayas and so it was a great place to start the season for for the the winter months of, of skiing um overseas but uh, so, yeah, I will be there um, until planned until the end of January mm-hmm. and then go back to Kashmir if it's possible in, in February um, or potentially um, Pakistan. I'm not really sure. It's kind of up in the air, like with a lot of things now. Right. So. Yeah. So you're just kind of on standby, sort of what happens with the travel restrictions for you to sort of get going yeah, again. I, mean, I may end up being in the Tetons for the winter. It's really, really hard to say, yeah. but it may be the best call for, uh, for, sure. uh, for us all to stay put. Sure. So, so we're all in standby. We've been in, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we, we've been guiding expeditions, not as full on as you, I'd say, but we've been to Himalayas for about 10 years off and on doing some peak climbing and also just some like Everest Space Camp treks with friends and stuff. And Great. then we and then we guide over here. We have a boat where we take people on like five day trips from Corona del Nido. And so that's been sort of our livelihood for the past mm-hmm. ten years. But as of March fifteenth, they sort yeah. of shut everything down. Shut no one's everything. been allowed in or out of the country for about two hundred and fifty days, I think now. And wow. they 
Uh, yeah, it's pretty strong. I mean, we even had a <laughs> time where we they locked us down in our houses for two weeks. We weren't allowed to leave our houses. Even if you wanted to go to the bank, you had to give an official your bank card. It was pretty out of hand. We were like, oh, my God. Thank, thank God we had some money stashed away, you know, in the Yeah, in the sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, and you know, it's, I think it's just tricky to be in charge right now. It's like you want to manage the COVID problem, but also, I mean, life's got to continue yeah. on. So I wouldn't, tricky. I wouldn't want to be the boss today. You know, today. <laughs> you know? <laughs> God. <laughs> Well, mm. you know, Luke, welcome. Oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. We're rolling. We're going to try and get on script. Get ready. Great. All okay. right. Let's, Let's do, it. do it. Okay. So welcome, Luke. Uh, thank you really for your time and thank you for uh, being with us. And uh, for our audience, tell us a little bit about yourself and your, a little bit of a background. Great. So uh, I'm pretty focused on climbing and skiing in the Himalayas and I have been for about a decade. Uh, I've made 75 expeditions there um, over the past decade and prior to that I was in Alaska for a decade. Um, I grew up um, on the east coast of the U.S. Um, then I was in Colorado for a while then Alaska and Himalayas. That's kind of a bit of my background. Uh, I work as a mountain guide uh, and also as a ski mountaineer uh, for some companies as an athlete. So, uh, um, for focus on some personal ski and alpinism projects in the Himalayas. And then I, I also, in between that, I, I do some guiding there. So that's, that's kind of what I do for uh, a living. Um, and currently I'm focused on the Himalaya 500, which is trying to ski 500 ski lines in the greater Himalaya, which to me is from Pakistan to, uh, Bhutan and even over into Myanmar. So, um, that's what I'm currently on and I'm, um, about halfway through with it. So that's kind of a bit of my background. All right, yeah. man. Badass. So I was lucky enough to, uh, my father was huge into skiing. He was on the ski team, you know, when he was like six years old, we grew up next to a mountain called white pass, Washington. So I could cool. cut school like half a day and <laughs> I'd split and I'd get half a day on the mountain. It was like 40 minutes from my house, so I was really lucky to uh, to get involved with skiing in the mountains pretty young. Pretty grateful awesome. for that. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm wondering, you, I, I've, I've read that you, um, you, you know, you grew up in North Carolina. But where did it all start? When did you uh, start climbing and strap on the so skis? I, I get that question. People are like, you're from North Carolina? <laughs> 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 I, I started when I was five, so we started going up to West Virginia uh, to ski the hills here. It's really, to people out west in the U.S. and even globally, like, the the skiing on the East Coast and the mountains on the East Coast are, are, are pretty small. Um, but that's where I got started was here in, in West Virginia and also in the, the hills, mountains, the Appalachians in yeah. Western North Carolina. And we started making trips out west, too, when I was a kid. And that's really where I started skiing and then I started climbing through some outdoor programs in, here in America, uh, outward bound <clears throat> when I was 12. And then that kind of led into, uh, climbing a lot in high school and then leading trips for the outdoor program in college. And that led into guiding and, and, uh, just my own, my own interests as a skier and climber. Okay. So that's kind of how that happened. Wow. Yeah. So let's talk about the, Himalayan 500 project. Can you give mm -hmm. us a yeah. brief background yeah, what, about this? How, how do, what, what's, what's it, what's it going to do? What's it, uh, what's the main Great. agenda? The main agenda is to bring more skiing to the Himalayas. Okay. Like I think, um, how I see it at least is Asia is going to blow up for skiing, um, in the coming decades. Yeah. I think, um, like we see it, in China, they're saying they're claiming they're building 800 ski resorts right now. Wow. Um, That's a lot. And then in, we definitely have the snow and the terrain in the Himalayas for, um, for um, ski resorts to be developed and ski community to be developed. Um, so if you kind of look at the U.S. as a model, like here in the 50s and 60s, 60s as like ski areas where we're built and ski hills, um, when like some of the big outdoor brands were started, um, mm -hmm. it was kind of, uh, 
I kind of feel like in, in Asia, that's what's going on right now um, with, uh, <clears throat> with um, a, a, a larger development of, of becoming mainstream to go into mountain sports like uh, skiing and, and, uh, and mountain climbing. That's, okay. So really the, the, the goal of the project is just to uh, highlight the Himalayas and how much there is there um, as a destination for skiing. So, uh, I really think that, uh, um, it, it's going to happen right now in Nepal. There's, there's guides that are going to, to France and they're, they're getting trained up on ski guiding and, uh, bringing more, uh, backcountry skiing there. Um, there is interest for making some ski hills there as well. Um, and also in Kashmir. So over in India, there's, there's definitely the snowpack and the terrain for, um, a lot of skiing to be developed and over into Pakistan too. Um, and then I have friends working also to try, try to get more skiing in Bhutan as well. So, uh, there's just a lot of skiing potential in the Himalayas that I think, um, needs to be highlighted and, um, people, um, a lot of folks now who are able to travel for skiing in Asia, go to the Alps or they go to other places in the world where there's great terrain and skiing and snow. Um, right there you know right. right there so there's no need to travel it's just making it it's kind of like the whole if you build it they will come thing so that's cool. yeah i would like to see more skiers in the himalaya so that's kind of the goal of the okay. project yeah so uh, uh, us being there quite a bit as well it's one of the things that uh, i've always wondered as well and i sort of look at like for example the kumbu region i'm going oh i don't know i you know i don't know it out west i don't really know the the sort of the how it references to the kumba but the kumba seems so far away you know like for a resort almost yeah. seems un inaccessible but i'm thinking you know i i've been up towards uh uh annapurna that area and it seems a little bit more accessible like the what do you call it Marty Hamal area and that that looks like it might be you know fairly close and to a resort someday I can see that but yeah so, it yeah. really uh, not to interrupt but like I think the Kumbu it's over it's like I have a friend he's been skiing for decades um in the Himalayas and he's tried in the Kumbu and you probably noticed it's it's quite dry there yeah so it kind of works in the winter months like the the ski season for most people um it works from west to east. So like the biggest, the mm -hmm. deepest snowpack is in the Karakoram over into the Pir Panjal of Kashmir. Yeah. And then as we work further east, it just gets more and more shallow and less and less snow. Mm -hmm. So okay. the storms kind of track for those, for the winter, for snow from the west. And then, yeah, the further east it gets, the less snow there is. So okay. really in terms of like a ski resort or having something like that, it would be, in Kashmir and Western Nepal in areas that are not up on that edge, like the Northern edge, like the Kumbu is, it would be on the, uh, the foothills and slopes just beneath, you know, the greater Himalaya chain, um, like out in, in Humla or places like that. Okay. Where it could potentially work. But. So I want to pull up a clip before we pull it up though. I want to say I have checked out your videos, man. I dig them. I really like your videos, and I, I think we need to see more of those. They're too short, but they're... Yeah, just, they're, they're, they're a work in progress. But, they're yeah, they're yeah, cool, lovely. Highlighted. And the local story, too, is really the yeah. story that you told. Yeah, I like that. So we're going to pull up one real quick. Young Himalaya, clip one. We don't have sound. Annapurna oh, is a place know. that's... Uh, when it comes up in people's minds, it's a place people think about mountaineering, uh, climbing one of the most dangerous mountains on earth. Yet around that peak is extraordinary ski terrain and consistent snowfall uh, that makes for an, an amazing ski experience during the months of February and March. I think what I love the most about skiing in the Annapurnas is the sheer scale of things. Uh, you're standing out on these slopes, skiing some beautiful runs, 
um, of all all types. You know, you got big panels you can ski down. You've got uh, these ramps between peaks. There's nice couloirs, uh, but always there's these just just massive terrain around you. Just the the sheer uh, the feeling of of being in the area. It's very powerful. And so of course the skiing is great. We can ski anywhere, but to ski in the Annapurnas amongst the greatest mountains on earth is a special experience. I think we haven't scratched the surface on how much there is to ski in the Annapurna region. There's just so much. Okay, man. I'm in. I'm in. Count me in. So yeah. I'm curious. Do you organize trips like this into the Annapurna? And if so, I what kind Yeah. Yeah? What kind yeah, of do Go ahead. ski Sorry. touring and then we also use heli access where we'll fly in and then tour for the day. Um, and I really think this brings up something that we haven't talked about, but in terms of like uh, management, it, it is a sanctuary, the Annapurna Sanctuary. So I, I don't think it's real resort potential. You know, I think oh, like okay. anywhere there should be some places that are uh, left pristine and wild. Sure. I think. Uh, we're not talking about putting a resort there. We're talking about you and I doing a trip. <laughs> okay, that's it. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, and I'm curious. So you organize trips in there and then how, what kind of experience does a person need and how do you evaluate it? And how do you, how do you organize a trip like this? Uh, people need to have backcountry skiing experience and really when groups come and my, my groups are pretty small. It's like three to five or six people. Um, that can be of varying ability levels or have uh, different um, goals for the trip. And so it's really, um, we have two guides along. So we can um, kind of, some people want to do more ski mountaineering stuff and some people want to powder ski. And so, uh, how do you organize that? Um, it's just, it's just really keeping groups small. I think whenever, uh, you try to bring big groups to an area, um, it really changes the whole, um, you can't, you can't really cater day to day for, for everyone on the trip. So, and how do you sort out if someone is, is, uh, prepared enough for it? Uh, it's just really just in conversation, yeah. um, just chatting with people about what they've done and, um, what they, what, what may be the best fit. Maybe they need another season ski touring at home or maybe they're ready. And it's really just chatting with folks about that. Okay. So I kind of want to figure that out. Yeah. So yeah. for example, let's say I show up and we're, you say, okay, we're in, we're going to do some, uh, uh, some skiing. We're going to do some lines. Are we going to hike all of our lines? So it's pretty much, we're going to back country, hike a line, climb up an area and then ski down it. Is that how we do it? I, I prefer that method. Yeah. I, I have done some heli skiing in the Annapurna area, but, and really if we're some of the, the lines there in the Annapurna's are at higher altitude. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have these big open panels and flanks, uh, beneath the higher altitude terrain. So, uh, we either hike that or do, do fly that to, it's to landing possible. zones yeah. up to 5,000 meters. So around 17,000 feet, mm -hmm. very poor at math, but right around <laughs> there. <to convert. laughs> but so, yeah, there's, there's a few ways to approach that. And it's just really how the trip's organized and, and how people uh, want to do the skiing. So right. these trips different. Cool. Well, I read you really love Kashmir and Homeland, the far west, Nepal. What makes this uh, place so special for you and for skiing, and how accessible is it? Uh, what would an average uh, ski or uh, tour or expedition look like here? For for Kashmir, I, I really love those two areas just because of the snow. Uh, they just get more snow than anywhere else in the Himalayas. So mm -hmm. on a given, you know, we'll get a, a what they call a western disturbance, which is a storm that comes in. They originate in the Mediterranean Sea. They come across in the first major or the major mountain range that they run into is the Himalayas. When that happens, it just uh, creates these storms that'll be up to two meters in snow, wow. uh, and, uh, seven feet of snow. 
Um, so big storms that come in and, um, it's just, yeah, in terms of powder skiing, there's, there's nowhere else in the Himalaya, Himalayas like it. Um, and so for people to go there, the best place is Golmark. And Golmark has a gondola that goes to 4,000 meters, uh, just under 14,000 feet. Um, and from the top of that gondola, you can tour out and ski all kinds of terrain. Um, pretty exciting terrain to open um, intermediate bowls, all kinds of uh, um, terrain for whatever people like to do. And then also the culture as well. Just, mm -hmm. it, just Kashmiri culture is, uh, is what they call uh, Kashmiri yacht, which is the Kashmiri way of life of just very warm people and very hospitable and um, uh, living in this true, it's just so beautiful. The Kashmir Valley is, is it's just amazing. It's this lush valley. There's a lot of apples growing there and it's, it's, it's uh, very green. Um, and, and it's very unique from just to the east over in Ladakh, where it's a high desert and a totally different landscape. So yeah. um, wow. that's why I love Kashmir. And then Humla is, is less developed for skiing. It's really, um, there, there's no skiing out there. And so it's just really, it's more of a expedition style. We go out with horses and we, we set a base camp in these uh, cirques and we'll, we'll ski tour out there. And you have the same snow as Kashmir, but it's more, um, it's definitely an, an expedition type of, of ski trip. Um, so in, in Gomar, you stay in a hotel each night and you ride up a gondola and in Humla we're, we're camping out in, in, uh, in tents and, and uh, okay. touring each day. So, yeah. cool. Wow. So Gomar, I'm sorry, is that, is that India or Pakistan? Where is it that? is. It's India, yeah, it's, right? it's just on the border um, with with Pakistan. Right. So it's right on the border there. So right. that that's probably the most accessible. Is that a ski resort, Gomar? Is it is it set it's, up for skiing or? It's a gondola that I like to explain it as a uh, backcountry area that happens to have a gondola. Um, <laughs> wow, true Indian style, it. nice. Well, it, it's like. There is a, a ski patrol in place. Uh, we do have like defined boundaries. Like here's the controlled ski area where when I was working there, I did, I ran the snow safety program, the avalanche forecasting there. Uh, we do control for avalanches in the ski area. So uh, we do place explosives and we do ski cutting after each uh, significant storm cycle um, to, to keep that area, um, to reduce the, the chance of an avalanche in that area. Right. So there is a ski area there, but I would say majority of, of users that go there are going for backcountry powder skiing. Just because when you look at Goldmark itself, for example, I think like a famous resort people might know is like Jackson hole. Yeah. It's like the size of like seven Jackson holes side by side. Um, it's, it's pretty massive. So, oh, wow. uh, people yeah. love that so oh, yeah that's cool i'm just curious when you say people go there uh who are they i mean from what country and are they locals or there's it's it's growing uh quite a lot in the past couple of years for domestic tourism okay. so a lot of people from india are coming up to ski there um but 70 percent of the international tourism is from russia oh. so you can fly into delhi Wow. Um, and then that same morning, usually flights arrive uh, around midnight or so, or just after. And that morning, you can fly into Srinagar, Kashmir, and be skiing that afternoon. So it's pretty quick access for the Himalayas for for skiing. And so, uh, but yeah, mostly Russian, uh, but there's also people coming from the UK. There's mm -hmm. people who are um, skiers from. Australia that want to want to catch some powder in the summer months and they they'll fly up and um, but really people from all over the world uh, there's people who've started to come from China as well to ski there too so uh, okay it's kind of an international destination Pretty so neat. so for you to uh, to go there you have to have at least a, a basic level of uh, skill um, you have to skiing. Know how to ski yeah you know how to ski. I, I you, do, you don't that, teach beginners well, like there is good beginner terrain. There is a meadow there and there's surface lifts. So people can go there to learn. Okay. Uh, there's great local ski instructors. 
mm, that okay. uh, <clears throat> so it is a it is a family destination uh, there's really nice hotels there so like if the family comes and someone doesn't like to ski they can they can uh, hang at the lodge and enjoy um, just Kashmiri yeah. cuisine and um, just uh, pashmina. And there's all these uh, wow. inter- interesting things to check out about Kashmir beyond skiing. Um, but also if the kids want to learn to ski in the meadow, there are good instructors. And then also there's uh, the bigger terrain for, for people who want the, the challenge. The, yeah. So. Sweet. Okay. So when somebody wants to do an expedition with you is this part of your your service when you're doing or or part of yeah your service i would say uh, are you providing sort of ski trips for people or is it more mountain guiding uh, mm, i would say yes we we really don't do we, we we're mountain guides yeah so we do as opposed to there are some folks who do like hotel logistics and and uh setting up things for people in terms of a service but we're more focused on guiding our own expeditions or guiding our own ski experiences so so one of our trips we we have people who want to uh learn more ski mountaineering skills so maybe they've done some backcountry skiing but they want to get into some bigger terrain and they Mm -hmm. want to um so gomar is a great spot to do that so we can go out and talk about some of those skills about using crampons and axes and ropes and how to, uh, um, to manage terrain for the current conditions. And, and so that's one thing we do there. And then also just a, a two week powder skiing trip. So just get out into backcountry areas with the guide safely. So, <clears throat> so in remote areas of the Himalayas, daily avalanche forecasts don't exist. Have you ever had any close calls with avalanches? I have not. Um, as a, a snow safety uh, director in Goldmark, I experienced a lot of avalanches because that's your job. Your job is to make avalanches. And yeah. so mm-hmm. I have been in avalanches there just because after each during each control morning, a control morning is whenever uh, you've gotten new snowfall or a significant wind event that's deposited new snow. Uh, we go in and, and cut it with our skis and produce avalanches to remove that hazard mm-hmm. um, for the user public. Um, in the greater Himalayas, I've I've seen large avalanches come off mountains, mostly Serac avalanches. So Serac's mm-hmm. just wow. a, a large chunk of ice um, as part of the glacier, and those will fall sometimes and create large avalanches. Um, and then in 2013, we were in a storm in the Garhwal Himalayas in central Indian Himalayas that brought um, about eight feet of snow in, in 60 hours. And it was, yeah, those are some of the largest avalanches I've ever seen uh, yeah. coming off just because yeah. you have this huge amount of snow and then, you know, you have a wall that's, you know, 8,000 feet high. And so when that, after the storm ends, that wants to shed off. And so, wow. I've, I've seen some big avalanches, but never had any close calls just because when you put up, when you put up base camps, you always put them where the saying is you put it where the grass goes, grows green. Mm-hmm. So when you're down in the meadow, far away from alpha angles An mm-hmm. alpha angle is just the run out of a slope. So like how far an avalanche will run. Um, you always have your base camp far enough away from a slope that it's, you're not going to get hit by an avalanche. And, right. Uh, you stay in place after big storms like that. Okay. Wow. So, Good advice. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> next time we, <laughs> next time you teach me how to ski. <laughs> yeah. You know, Filipinos don't, uh, we don't even know what eyes and snows are, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Do you know Janet's history, Luke? I don't. Yeah. Janet here. She's uh her and her team of girls are the first women to traverse Everest. They traversed from China to uh, Nepal about 12 years ago. In 2007. You know, have you ever seen that movie, uh, Cool Runnings, the Jamaican bobsled team? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. sort of like that. <laughs> <laughs> I always laugh at Jan. I said, you guys are like Cool Runnings because you never saw snow before. Yeah, when, wow. we, were, yeah, when we were there in 2007 uh, in North side china tibet uh side there were two i'm not quite sure where they're from but uh 
they were supposed to ski down uh, from, oh. yeah, from Camp 3 or Camp 2 of Northside. So, yes, there were two people attempting that. So that was 2007. Were they Spanish? A chance. I'm not was sure, it? really. Uh, um, what was it? Were they what? They were, they, they're, they're going to climb Everest and yeah. then going to ski, ski down. down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. So we met them somewhere um, after the border in Kudari and, you know, in the tea house. So that was their attempt. But I'm not sure if they did it or mm. and if ever happened. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> but yes, there's a lot of people who are skiing. So that would lead to my uh, next question. Uh, you have skied Shisha Pangma. Uh, Shisha had, Pangma, yes. Like the way you climbed Everest is, people say it's like the dream way. Yeah. It's like the best way. Yeah. Like to climb the north side and descend the south, there's like no better way to climb Everest. Pretty yes. cool, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Awesome. Pretty yeah. cool. You, you know, know, I'm sorry, <laughs> let me step in here. Yeah. I, I tell a bit of her story. I probably tell it more than she does because she's so humble. I get to sort of <laughs> brag about her, but... You know, when they got to the summit, the weather systems are different on the north side and the south side. And she gets to the summit, and they're going to go back down the south side. And they hadn't fixed the lines yet because the season wouldn't permit it. So she had to descend all the way down to uh, Hillary's steps without ropes. Yeah, a little bit before Hillary. Yeah, there was no rope back then, so I was holding on to my my Sherpa for dear life for quite some time. (laughs) So, yeah, that was really scary. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, okay. So, yeah. The, yeah. The Shisha Pangma. So, one of the 8,000 meter. Yeah. Uh, tell mountain. us about that. Tell us about uh, that project. How was that? It was really neat. We, uh, we stayed late that season. Um, the other teams that were on the mountain left early. Well, the last one, they went over to Cho OU because they were trying to do this double header. Um, so I ended up climbing it with, uh, I had one guest with me and then, uh, um, Nima Tenzi was with me too, the three of us. And it was, it was no one on the mountain, the same sort of deal. Uh, there weren't any fixed ropes. Mm. Uh, we were just climbing it. Um, and it was kind of neat because we were the only team on the mountain, which I think is pretty special these days on an 8,000 meter peak yeah. to yes. experience without others around. And, uh, We had a good summit day. Um, It was long and exhausting. Mm -hmm. Uh, The view was extraordinary. (laughs) Uh, The skiing was um, ski mountaineering. Yeah. (laughs) So so it's exhausting on the way up. And you're coming down is usually the hardest part, you know, and then you're going to ski it. Did you how did you feel? I, I skied from 7,400, mm-hmm. which is like uh, the highest camp um, up above there. Uh, it was the spring. So like really, I think the more popular season for, for those, those for Shishapeng and Cho'o'u is the autumn season when there's more snow on the yeah. peak post-monsoon. So a little cold. Um, it was it was mixed. It was ice and rock above there. So mm. it was, wasn't really skiable um, on the route I was on. So I think getting out onto the northeast face, it could have been skied, but that wasn't in the cards because yeah. I had a guest with me and um, that, that wasn't going to happen. Okay. But I love to go back. <laughs> <laughs> so. how, how long did it take you to climb uh, to the summit? Yeah, right. How long did, you, did it take you to climb to the summit? We had a 15-hour day. Yeah. That. Yeah. That's yeah. Uh, it, was, than it was a healthy yeah. healthy day and yeah. then yeah. how uh, long did you ski down uh the ski down took me a ski down to our highest camp we called camp three it was actually we didn't camp at 7300 we camped in the just down below there that was probably hour down it's pretty wow. quick wow, yeah, cool. to get to there so wow! I bet everybody, well, everybody on your team was jealous. <laughs> they were well. It was yeah. She was with Nima Tenzi, and the other guys had decided to stay behind in camp. Um, they were one guy was not feeling well, and mm. um, uh, um, Lord, what's his name? Galzin stayed with him. 
Gelsing Sherpa. Gelsing. So, oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's kind of Shishapengma. But there's yeah, there's there is a, a big ski line on Shishapengma that has not been done that I'd love you, to go back. You're looking so, at that. You I can tell summit. he's chosen so. to go back. <laughs> so that's part of your plan, the to go back to Shishapengma. What other eight thousand meter peaks uh, are you planning to do or, for the yeah. five hundred project? Do you have any on your uh, five hundred project? Next summer is uh, I'm planning for Gastrobrom two. Wow. Um, so G2, and then I'll go to another route on another peak that um, I'm kind of keeping quiet for now. Uh, just just climbing, but it won't be a ski mm -hmm. ski project for the second peak. But uh, that's what I have planned for for next year. So okay. nice. We'll see how it goes. What about you? Are you gonna, Exciting. Are you going to climb another one? Uh, oh, of course. <laughs> yes, it's not a closed door. It's still an open door <laughs> right now <laughs> about climbing. Yeah, yes, you why know, not? <laughs> since we uh, have been reading about you, we want to go with you. We want to do some unclimbed peeps, peaks, actually. That's, yes. I, I just, okay. I'm, yeah, that's really where we're at. We've been talking about this for a while. In fact, last time we were there, we were there two years ago, I think it was. And we were really talking to people about some unclimbed peaks, but we couldn't really find anybody that was very knowledgeable mm -hmm. on how to do it, uh, how to get the permits. But we're, we're curious about that. Like, for example, when you climb an unclimbed peak and you do the route, do you get to name it like, you know, the Becky route or whatever like they do in the States or how does that work? Well, I mean, I, to me, I've, I've always thought – if I climb an unclimbed peak or, or you do get, yeah, I guess you do get to name it, but it would think, I, I right? Yeah. Uh, how much, how much, <laughs> go ahead. To me, I think it's kind of odd to, yeah. it's like there was a peak, uh, a couple years ago. Uh, I won't mention any names, but mm -hmm. they named it after her last name. You know, it's just kind of in the Himalayas doesn't make sense. It doesn't. Yeah. So it's kind of, I think things need to be uh, regionally relevant. Yeah. So it's like if, if we're in a certain area, it should be named something that's uh, culturally relevant and just. I'm with you. I, I can't yeah. imagine. I'm climbing Mount Chumalungama and I'm climbing the Luke Smithnick Wick route. <laughs> you know, right. It doesn't right. work. It's not, it, to me, I, I don't. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not really into that and I don't. Um, yeah. What else? Just the whole conquering thing. You know, it's just kind of, we're not conquering anything. But, we're just, we're just yeah, being allowed to right. when the conditions oh, yeah. are right. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. The only anyway. thing that you conquer is yourself, not the mountains, not anything Perfect. else. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Is there, so when you say about the, the naming, um, but, you you still put in a record like you yeah you, how does you, that work you coordinate with the locals and say hey i climbed this and climbed peak this and this and this is, I, is that i've how documented works? i have notes of everything that i've done i've taken a lot of photographs but mm -hmm. i haven't ever reported any um mm. I've, i haven't written anything into any of the journals yet so i've okay. just been keeping my own notes um because there, there for, is an agency one, that's keeping track of a lot of the unclimbed peaks somewhere in Kathmandu. There are. Yeah, there's, so there's like the Himalayan database in Kathmandu, which is Elizabeth Hawley, mm -hmm. um, a journalist who did it from like the days of Hillary. Right. When Hillary first climbed Everest, um, all the way to now, there's people that are um, continuing her work. She passed away yeah, a Yeah, that's years right. Ago. Yeah, she I read that. Um, so there is her... Or there is that entity, and then you also have the Japanese Alpine Club, and you have the American Alpine Club, right. and you have all these uh, clubs and organizations keeping track all over the globe. And uh, that's kind of one thing I'm working on too is a um, a uh, something called the Himalaya Library, which is to kind of bring that all together. And I won't say that all these organizations aren't communicating already and keeping track of things, but it would be nice to have a searchable database that's global. Yes. Yeah. So, like, you know, I, I kind of feel like in some ways, some of these areas of the Himalayas keep getting rediscovered, um, if you know what I mean. Sure. It's like, uh, so, you know, uh, so-and-so goes and climbs this route, and they're saying, we've discovered this new area, mm. and really, like, you know, mm. um, 
you know, Jeff in 1974 did it in a sweatpants or whatever, <laughs> you know, it's already been done. It's right. like, uh, there needs to be more of a, cl- a collective body of what's been done in the Himalayas yeah. um, as opposed to having all these entity, all these different out, different organizations. Anyway, if that makes sense. That's sure does. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm really, one of the reasons I, I would like to get on the Unclimbed Peaks is when I got into climbing years ago was really sort of the solace of being outdoor and going to places where you were sort of on, all alone and, and working out a, a crag. And, you know, I was doing a lot of trad climbing when I was younger. Mm-hmm. And that's where I sort of, and then climbing just all of a sudden went mm-hmm. berserko. Everybody started going, there was climbing gyms popping up all over America. And then all of a sudden you'd go out to the crag and there'd be a lineup at the crag and it was freaking me out. I was actually like, man, I don't want to be here. This is my spot. It just got so busy everywhere. And so that search for the places of solace and solitude became, you know, when I got to the Himalayas, I was like, okay, this is cool. There's a lot of places you can go here. But, you know, you got the island peaks and the Labuche. Uh Again, what was freaking me out when I got there is my whole life I had placed my pro. I had set up my lines. I'd done all of that. And then when I got to the Himalayas and I was like, these lines are already set up. For me, uh-huh. it was weird. So uh-huh. I'm more into, you know, going to a place that's um, a bit more organic where you do all of that yourself. And uh, so more sure. unclimbed peaks. Sure. That's my style. I'm, I'm sure the Himalayas uh, will offer you, um, you know, it offered an me, infinite, you know? yeah, <laughs> infinite uh, peaks to do that. Yes. And, and you know, sure. that's why we sort of like, it's great to hear that you're doing this, Luke, and and a lot of people are are drawn into to Everest and and this uh, peaks that are always been talked about. But the ones that are not been talked about, these are the ones that are, you know. I think it oh, should be, be a it, lot of yeah. There's a lot there, of there for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's Super. a lot of beautiful climbs in the uh, Himalayas still waiting, definitely yes. that are uh, off the beaten track. And yeah, it's kind of you know why I'm focused on it is what you're just saying about the wilderness experience, like while we go into the mountains is to, you know, spread out a little yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's really neat to go out and, you know, figure it all out. You know, you go on an exploratory expedition to an unclimbed peak and you need extra time. You need a little extra time mm-hmm. and to even figure out where sure. base camp may be, right. go from there. And, you know, you've got this very grainy, basic, uh, Google earth image, um, that really, um That's gives you a general true. idea but do you know if that boulder field is you know is it giant boulders or scree or mm-hmm. everything it's just it's hard to really tell until you get out there and then and uh it's just a really fun experience it really is to uh um, not to say that going to the kumbu i mean i love going to the kumbu you meet people from all over the yeah. world and and you get to experience sherpa culture and see these extraordinary uh you know the highest mountain on earth and, mm-hmm. and uh yeah, I love it all, yeah, but uh, right. I definitely have a penchant for, for unclimbed peaks and more off the beaten track areas. That's so great. Luke, let's get stuck yeah. into climbing. We're going to move out of skiing here. Let's Tell us a little bit about Himalayan Alpine Guides. So uh-huh. our audience kind of knows what you guys are doing out there. And yeah, give us a brief background on, on that. So I, I started Himalayan Alpine Guides in 2010. Um, the focus is on more exploratory climbing. So we're, we're, we're going out to, to attempt unclimbed peaks in, um, uh, all across the range. And we have people come from, from all ability levels, um, and have, who have different, uh, um, uh, goals. And so it, it's really working with people individually on, on, um, on what they like to do. I mean, sometimes we'll have an exploratory unclimbed trip and then, you know, the first part of it, we'll do some, uh, some intro to some intro skills for people. And then other parts, other, other folks on the expedition will be going for the, the you know, the summit ascent. And um, so we have all kinds of folks coming over for treks and climbs and ski trips and uh, with more of a focus on, yeah, the um, exploratory areas, even though we do offer, offer, uh, the classics you know you're saying yeah. island peak and yeah yeah they're great um, they're definitely good training peaks 
the island peak and the buche mm-hmm. it's a pretty yeah. cool area yeah absolutely uh, yeah and it's really nice to have the tea houses there so mm. um it's definitely simpler that way to you can go into the kumbu and not have to bring a um a, a big full expedition it's, yeah it's nice that way so yeah. 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 So, uh, look, your expeditions are focused most mostly on unclimbed peaks, uh, which means mm-hmm. no one has submitted them before, you know, or submitted them before. How do you rate them for your clients? Uh, for example, the island peak is rated the mo to I think moderate to moderate difficulty with moderate difficulty. The approach is well known, and this is usually with the lines already set, and it been it has been climbed a hundred times, you know. Tell us about this Absolutely. process as a whole in general. It's really the, uh, gosh, the, um, in terms of difficulty, why, why peaks are unclimbed is they're either really far away, mm-hmm. like they take uh, a couple weeks to get out to, like if we go into Mustang in like central Nepal, mm-hmm. like we went to uh, Arnico Chuli, which I think still remains, uh, or maybe two of the aspects are unclimbed. Mm-hmm. It took us, uh, you know, 12 days of, of uh, walking to get out wow. to base camp. So so for one reason, either they're really far out there or the other reason is they're just very technical, very difficult. Um, mm-hmm. And I would say in terms of what we're, um, what we're guiding is generally things that have big approaches um, because the stuff this, that's – Close, it's like if you look at right next to Everest, there's a peak that's unclimbed. Mm-hmm. So like when you're in Everest base camp, you have Kangri Shar. Um, it's right there. And we attempted it two years ago, me and my climbing partner, uh, Frederick Strang. And uh, it remains unclimbed for a reason. It's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's difficult. <laughs> it is difficult and it's south facing. So okay. each day when it catches the sun, you mm-hmm. have rock fall. Right. And it, uh, it's just dangerous. It's a really yeah. dangerous peak. And uh, I do think there's a line that, that may go on it. Um, I won't say where. Yeah. <laughs> but, it's all uh, secret. Yeah, so it's like th- those are really super technical, and it's maybe something that I may have be, be approaching as um, a climbing athlete but not guiding. So I think what we guide is things that are um, just further, further out there. And so, like, um, we didn't summit two years ago, but we went and attempted – Labo Che Kong, which is uh, one of the world's highest unclimbed peaks. Um, the world's highest is in <clears throat> Bhutan, um, and which is called, uh, oh, it'll come to me. The name doesn't come to me right now. Oh, uh, yeah, Michus. It starts with an M. Mich, Michus. Well, there I, is Muchu Chish, I was going to say, which yeah. is in Pakistan. A friend of mine went and attempted it this fall, and it was not in shape. It was just blue mm-hmm. ice and uh, just, just not. Mm-hmm. Not for it. So there's Mutu Chish and then Gangkar Punsum, which is in uh, Bhutan. And that's the world's, between those two, um, those two are the highest unclimbed. But the, sorry, I think that it's Gangkar Punsum is the highest. And then it's mm-hmm. uh, um, Labu Chikong. Labu Chikong, thank yeah. you. And yeah. so legally, the world's highest legally unclimbed is mm-hmm. is uh, Lobo Chek Kong, which right. is in China. So the other ones, legally you can't climb it, correct? You can't get the permits. Correct. Yeah. So, oh. is that um, that's kind of what climbing is in Bhutan right now. It's just mm-hmm. it's just off limits, which mm-hmm. I respect. Mm-hmm. Um, but Lobo Chek Kong is is still there waiting. Uh, it's just one valley over from Cho Yu to the west. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's just because we've been focused on the the higher peaks, you know, on 8,000 meter peaks is why it's remained unclimbed and waiting there. And it's an extraordinary area, it really is. Uh, to get out there was was uh, amazing, and I, I really want to go back. It's uh, we got up to within 200 meters of the summit. Uh, we had some winds and a couple members that were quite tired from a big from a big push and we decided to head down because our forecast we had gotten said um, strong winds were coming in the next day that were definitely frostbite potential. And so we, we headed down and we had a, a great expedition. We didn't summit, but we had this total wilderness experience. We didn't see a soul the entire time and <laughs> climbed in this remote valley 
way out there and just uh everybody was was uh quite happy with the trip but of course we want to go back and try to get the summit yeah so. i read i read a story on that in fact <laughs> Since we're talking about it, I have another clip I found. I believe this is you guys, so uh, I'm going to pull up a quick clip. H, this is called Le Bouche Kong. Okay. No, Le Bouche Kong. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Is that you guys? <laughs> okay. Oh, what's that? <laughs> I don't know. I, I was reading about that <laughs> climb, and it sounded like it was hard as hell when I, I heard about all the crevasse falls and oh. uh, the glacier into the water. And then I came across that clip, and I go, that must be them. <laughs> Is that your story? Yeah, we did have a lot of crevasse. It was a hard trip. <laughs> <laughs> like selective uh, amnesia or whatever. I guess in alpinists, you don't really remember the hard times. But, yeah, it was hard. It was really hard. So, yeah, we had some pretty big crevasse falls and it, it was tough going for sure it, it so. looks like that last clip somebody's actually getting pulled out of the water yeah it yeah that like was it. a big uh yeah someone punched through and it, it was uh yeah that was a full oh man full <laughs> that's a bad day so how many were you <laughs> when you say it's a big we were, group uh, we were five of us those five of us so no there was seven of us total yeah uh, so. yeah yeah, so that's... you guys, it looks like you did some sort of helicopter approach back in there. It's way back. And well, go that ahead. was, we flew into Langtang and we spent uh, four days there acclimatizing from the village of Kengjin Gompa, uh, just going up to 5,000 meters uh, for those days. And then we flew back to Kathmandu. And we did that because we were waiting for some permitting. We got mm. delayed. Yeah. Uh, trying to get into China from Nepal. It's generally how things work in China. Uh, Janet, you probably know. Yeah. Is just uh, you bring uh, the team and everything from Kathmandu because uh, currently, even though I've done some research in Lhasa, and it doesn't seem you can really put together uh, an expedition team in Lhasa, which uh, I've always, I'm not sure why that is, but um, you go from, you start from Kathmandu and come back to Kathmandu. So. Yeah, yeah, that's what we did, and uh, it was a. I just not sure how many hours is a bus ride, but when we um, got off in the Kudari, everything changed. You know, it's like uh, from really rugged like Nepali side to s sort of like stern, very straight side in China, and there's a yeah. huge, like a huge Chinese flag that will greet you, and buildings and gates and it was just like freaky like different place yeah, different place and and yeah. the 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 person who's checking your passport would just like look at you look at your passport look at you look at your passport so many times several times and you don't yeah. know if you're gonna smile or say hi or just gonna stare at him you know it's like it was a <laughs> totally different aura so yes yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hear you <laughs> yeah. yeah for sure yeah, so going back to Labuche Kong, let's talk about that route a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. It it looks cool. It looks yeah, you guys it does. nearly summited. I think I read you were four hundred meters from the summit. You um, were saying thank, you were you, yeah, you were right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you were you were pretty close. You were feeling pretty good. It sounds like you know maybe a couple other team members were there, but you're mm -hmm. crunched for time and you were getting a bad weather report. But tell us about the climb in general. It hasn't been climbed yet, I presume. It still remains on climb. There was a Polish team that tried it two years before us, um, mm -hmm. and it, it's still still waiting. I think that route will go. I think that really is the way I mean, beyond all those crevasses uh, to get through those. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think our timing was good. Um, it may work to go in the autumn season post monsoon when it's, when it's instead of what colder. we did in the spring because yeah. you'd have more snow bridging right. to cover those grasses. Um, and uh, <clears throat> but either season can work. It really depends on how the snow piles up. Um, it's there, so it, it's it's waiting for okay. For uh, how how about your team? Here. When you guys, yeah. you went back in there and you said, uh, I think you were in Latang and you, that's where you guys did your acclimatization. How did, it, how'd that go for everybody? You know, you probably far different sort of human being in that area than a lot of guys. Cause you're, you're up there a lot, but how did the rest of it, how did the rest of the team do with their altitude? Everyone was good. Uh, one guy has climbed to OU already. Um, mm. uh, and everyone had a, a lot of mileage. Everyone was quite fit. Um, I, I do have more more mileage generally than um, the guests that come, just mm -hmm. just because it's what I do. Yeah. Um, I think that any of us, if if you put it in the mileage, you can, you can do it. Yeah. Um, I think it's only like like two percent of the population globally cannot acclimatize. Okay. So it's just a function of you know training more in terms in terms of being fit for an expedition. But everyone did well. Um, but maybe we could have had one more camp uh for 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 uh for getting to the summit yeah maybe a bit of a push to do um that final that four last day was a little too too big for some of the team mm -hmm. yeah yeah it was just we were really getting pushed for that forecast which was unfortunate um yeah. so we got back down and it that weather never came Oh, it hurts. Yeah. hurts. But, you know, that's that's yeah. the story. That's how it goes. Well, that's the beauty yeah. of the mountain. You really never know what's going to offer you. <laughs> Luke, yeah. when, you're, when, you're, when you're looking for unclimbed peaks, mm -hmm. you're going to have to give me the beta here so I can figure it out. How do you find them? How do you find un unclimbed peaks? Do you, do you go through journals or... Yeah, I, I use the journals a lot. American Alpine Journal, mm -hmm. uh, the Asian Alpine E News uh, is really good, and I could give people links to that if they like. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good one. It comes out of uh, they're, they're in Japan. I'm not sure specifically okay. where. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Himalayan Club in India puts out the Himalayan Journal, and that's out of Mumbai, and that's a good resource. Um, and there's a few in Europe as well. Um, so from those, you can kind of figure out um, if a peak um, has, has been climbed or not. Mm -hmm. But it's also tricky to know. It's like, I think some things have been climbed um, that, that there isn't a record of. Sure. So I'm sure that happens. It's just too grandiose yeah. for that not to happen. Yeah. What, do you, what do you look for when you're, when you're picking a peak? for an expedition or for something for you that's on your list? What do you look for in or out? Uh, unclimbed is huge. And then aesthetics as well, you know, something that um, just, uh, just, just inspires me. Right. So uh, that's really, really what I look for. And uh, yeah, for sure. Well, I saw so, some of those yeah. pictures recently of the, the Caracom area. And that's yeah, for, that, that just cool. I mean blows my mind just the photos I'm like it's a yeah. weird mix it to me I don't know I, I sort of could describe it like a mixture between Himalayan and, and Patagonia rock it's just I don't know it's very dramatic some of those shots I saw yeah. recently it just looks so cool back in there it's amazing that was my first trip in there and I was just blown away yeah, yeah great just, great photography place. by the way some great shots yeah. you came back with really dug that on the, on this climbing expeditions Luke, do you have a team that sets the lines uh while the client um you know rests or hangs in camps or do you do it traditionally where everyone works together to lay the lines and uh like a alpine style sort of speak it, it really depends on the trip um i, I do both mm, so some okay. do an expedition style and some we do an alpine style um uh, okay, most of the 7,000, 8,000 meter. No, I won't say that. All the 8,000 meter stuff I've done was in expedition style mm -hmm. so far. Um, all the, 
and then 7,000 meters I've done alpine style and expedition style. So it really depends on the trip and what people would like to do. So uh, we, we definitely do both where we will establish camps and fix ropes in advance. Um, and then we'll do a style where we just climb from a high camp or even from base camp um, with uh, moving together on a rope in alpine style. So bo- both styles. Definitely. So, so far, uh, all your expeditions, you know, with clients, uh, did they go smooth or did you ever had any sort of like problems, you know, like getting sick or attitude problems, <laughs> altitude and attitude problems. <laughs> altitude, atti- altitude, was that a Freudian? <laughs> yeah, you know, the mountains are, uh, it really brings out our, our true nature, you oh, know, yeah. and it does, uh, it, it's everyone, you know, at the start of trips, I always talk to people and say, you know, everyone's going to have a rough day on that, on the, on this trip. You know, it's just mm-hmm. being altitude is, is you know, in these harsh environments is, is hard. And so we just have to be patient with each other and uh, be there for each other and communicate. Well, if you're not feeling well, let, let someone know, let me know. Um, so in terms of attitude, um, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. There, you know, people disagree with each other. Um, sometimes we, we disagree on expeditions and, but it's all about just t- talking it out. And so every day at the end of the day, uh, we all sit down in the dining tent or mm-hmm. in the tent or up on the mountain and say, um, what could we have done better today? And everyone gets a chance to say, I thought we could have done this better, you know, so we get to talk it out every day. And then we also talk about, I always ask people, where were we least safe today? Or did you feel unsafe today at any yeah. point? And we, we talk about that. And people get a chance to give their perspective. So it's, it's possible I may see something a certain way and someone else may see it a different way. And so it's, it's, it's always important to, to give, to have, you know, everyone gets, it, it's, um, it, you know, we're, we're, we're all in it together. And so it's yeah. really good to, um, to talk that out. And, uh, because I think there's something that we talk about in snow science or in, uh, or in, uh, avalanche work called the expert halo. It's like mm-hmm. the idea that this person that has more experience mm-hmm. and has done a lot, um, people are, um, prone to, to look to that person sure. for the decision-making and to, and to, uh, you know, to be the person with the answers. Right. Yes. Uh, and that person is, is not infallible, you know? So mm-hmm. as a, as a guide, uh, we can make mistakes. And so I always listen to, it's like when I was running the snow safety program in Goldmark, like I'd have a first year beginner ski patroller. And I would say, what do you think about this? And mm-hmm. I would listen to his opinion. And we always go with the most conservative opinion because, uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's really the best way to go okay. you know? in terms of risk management. <clears throat> that's, that's really, uh, what they found is that a lot of times the, 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 it was obvious there was, you know, an accident could have occurred and maybe, you know, the, you know, the leader took over and, and that accident happened because of that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I think the reason why I really have had, essentially a hundred percent safety record. Um, I did have someone trip on, on an approach to a peak in Makalu an unclimbed peak and they, they, uh, dislocated their finger one year. Um, but beyond that, we've, we've never had a fatality and we've never had a major accident just yeah. because, um, what I just said, you know, yeah. listening to people, we all listen and talk about things. Um, and then also, um, just being very conservative because we're really far out there and there, there is not a, a helicopter that comes yeah. in, right. you know, yeah. up in all these places. Good so, on you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Great advice. How difficult is it to get the permits for unclimbed peaks? It, it can really, you know, it, it changes from decade to decade. And so that's mm. why I think I'll yeah. continue to do this because there's areas that aren't currently open now <clears throat> that may be open in a decade from now. And whereas, uh, and vice versa, like things that weren't open 10 years ago are now open. Mm-hmm. And so it's, 
uh, when those areas open up, um, you can apply and, and get and get that permit. And it really depends on the area. So yeah, there is a lot of work for sure involved in, in securing a permit from an unclimbed peak, um, okay. but it is possible. Yeah. So I do encourage people to try. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. <clears throat> so how do you, how do you do it? Like, for example, you've spotted a, an unclimbed peak and you go to that area. Do you uh, get in touch with local authorities first or are you just just go directly to the site or how, how do you do it? Uh, it really depends on the country. Like for example, in India, um, it needs to be a joint expedition. Okay. And so there would be hmm. uh, um, uh, national members, mm -hmm. um, people from India, and then uh, foreign members, if there's foreign members coming, um, there's definitely alpinists and mountaineers in India that are um, organizing expeditions and doing it on their own. But mm -hmm. if, if there were, you know, foreigners coming in, they would need to do it with, with, uh, as a joint expedition. And so that's the first step there. And then there's like, for example, if you're going to the Eastern Karakoram up in Northern India, um, you need to go to five governing bodies. You have the wow. Indo-Tibetan border police, you have the local police, you have, uh, the IB, the intelligence bureau, you have, uh, India Mountaineering Foundation. And so you have to go through all those steps wow. for India. Uh, then in Nepal, <clears throat> you uh, there is a list, I believe, of unclimbed peaks and you uh, go through their program. Um, so it, it really it's really best to check uh, through uh, the national uh, body of, for permitting for unclimbed peaks in a given country, so. Well, I, I assume right now that you've been doing this for a couple of years already, that you have established contacts and, you know, people to get in touch uh, way ahead of time. So I think that's Absolutely. really a good edge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Luke, let's make a little shift here. Tell us about your most challenging expedition of your career, climbing a 20,000 foot peak called... I Bagiratitu in the Himalayas when you were blanketed with eight feet of snow in 60 hours. Wow. Yeah. Can you break this down for us? Give us a devil in the detail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was the, the trick with that one. That was an alpine style expedition. We were mm. going to climb uh, Bagiratitu. And we just got a big storm. Uh, the, the Garwal Himalaya have had success and failure. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Shiveling last year. Uh, we got a lot of snow again and did not climb the peak. Uh, we summited Sadopont there, which is a <clears throat> 7,000 meter peak. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just this like vortex of, 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 of weather sometimes. Like when systems move in there, they, they kind of just sit there. You know, like you have this air mass, this this parcel where it moves in and it just, when it hits the Himalaya, it just kind of sticks on those peaks jutting up and just kind of sits there and just storms. Mm -hmm. and so during that event in 2013, uh, that, that big snowstorm came, uh, we waited for a day or so. And that's when I was talking earlier in this talk about, uh, the big avalanches that I saw, mm -hmm. uh, that we saw come down. Um, that was very challenging yeah because we were yeah definitely just uh wading through you know waist deep snow for for a long way and we had all the wildlife of the valley as we were uh, getting out of there following us out of the valley wow when i saw that i really realized we were experiencing something <laughs> that doesn't happen there very often Everybody when the wildlife are leaving the you yeah. know that uh, <laughs> something's wrong <laughs> time to go <laughs> yeah so like the blue sheep the blue sheep is like the main prey of the snow leopard mm. we're oh. following us i have video of it out wow. of the valley so we're like breaking trail i would think there was it was like seven of us mm -hmm. uh we're breaking trail to get down to a point where a porter team had brought our stuff up to and hauling loads back and forth to get down below the snow line um and behind this there's like 60 to 100 blue sheep wow. following our tracks to get down because they hadn't had food and they couldn't get any calories um in late fall um for days and so they were they were following us down and then oh, yeah. at night the snow leopard was coming in and actually 
praying on the flock there while we were there camping. And then it was just a wild experience that someday I'll, <laughs> I need to need to write, write about it. I think. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. You, you get so much snow, I'm guessing, are you t- constantly spending time digging yourself out around the, you know, your tents, <laughs> your camp sort of, so you're not. Where, yeah. So we had two, two snow shovels for us with us. You know, like avalanche rescue so it was the little guys that carry mm-hmm. your pack mm-hmm. uh, that we were using to shovel out and then we also had pots from the kitchen uh, to shovel as well <laughs> and it was just it was so much snow coming wow. and um, we stayed in place <clears throat> and then decided to or I decided to, to get us out of there it was time to get out so uh, yeah it was just a lot of shoveling to so a lot of shoveling you're sort of sitting in the tents and shoveling shoveling your way out keeping yourselves from being buried so to speak and then when the snow eases you're like let's get the heck out of here and then you got to get on top of that stuff and (laughs) wade through it and i'm guessing not everybody's got snowshoes so no, we didn't have any it was right. mountaineering so yeah. it's hard it's hard getting out of there eh? True. it really was and the yeah you really have to keep shoveling just to keep from losing the tents because the tents right. are the place of warmth and and where you, you dry out and so if the, if the tents collapse and break then it's a uh, pretty dire 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 situation mm-hmm. so yeah. yeah a lot of shoveling just to survive there was and, no there was no sleep yeah, we've heard some weird sure. stories about uh, some stuff in the Himalayas, like, you know, during trekking season. And I can't remember exactly where that happened, but somewhere in the region. And, Chola. I think Chola was. And Aparna, yeah, Chola. Much, yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, you've got trekkers in between tea houses, and mm-hmm. they got caught in a snowstorm and mm-hmm. just could never make it, you know, buried. Yeah during you know they lost like 20 or 30 people some crazy story man just came on and uh, you know you're trekking from tea house to tea house and you just couldn't make it it's phenomenal that was that in the last few years like 2016 or 20 something like yeah yeah recent yeah when you were there i was in that as well now we were in the annapurnas during that okay and we're going up to climb hemlong which is a seven thousand meter peak there and and uh had that storm and uh yeah those also it's, some people lost in the end yeah that's just that. it's hard to fathom you know snowfall mm-hmm. to that degree i just yeah i think that one was a cyclone maybe right Sometimes that's you, exactly well, what happened some typhoon came across the himalaya mm-hmm. and just dumped and made oh yeah that's right anyway bit of a hard story part of the yeah. mountains but yeah. anyway yeah, so when it hits hard, it hits pretty hard there. Certainly. Yeah. Hey, moving. I, I was talking. You got so many. You got so many ascents, and you got so many skied lines now. It's it's phenomenal. You know, they're talking that you're the man in the mountains. That's uh, you're you're the new explorer of the Himalayas, but you have a really high success rate. Uh, what is? Do you have a secret or a strategy? It's really um, go when the weather's good. That's all it is. So yeah. um, if everyone is not, if there's no one sim- has symptoms of altitude illness, um, everyone's feeling good and things are, are, are trending like uh, we can go for a summit attempt, then go for it. Because mm-hmm. when, when the weather comes in the Himalayas, you go. And so that's that's really what it is. So um, being there at the um, right time, everybody's ready to go, prepared. And when the window opens, it's do or go die. Go for it. Do it. Yeah, <laughs> it's the <Yeah>. window. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I would say. And just persistence. Just be persistent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Well, yeah. do you have a yearly circuit from Kathmandu, Nepal, to Ladakh, India, and Victor, Idaho? Have you figured out how to stay in Nepal past the six-month limitation? Yeah, we're yeah, curious about that. Thing. That thing's really stuffing us up, that six-month limitation. We sure. Can't seem to figure I, I that stay out. mostly in India. So oh. most of the year I'm in India in the winter and summer months. So I really just come for the... A short period of time in the spring, a short period of time in the autumn to Nepal. 
but uh, I'm mostly in uh, Indian Himalayas, okay. I would say. I think if I look to the, I think I'm, a, I, I am, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> from like uh, June through um, like early September, even into mid-September now, because the monsoon is running longer, at least in the last five years, it's been running into late September. Mm. So to mid-September and then, uh, so I go to Nepal for October, November and April, May. Um, but that's been changing when I was skiing. But, so I've, I haven't really stayed um, in Nepal for more than six months since uh, mm. like 20, 2012 or so. I did have a, a flat in Kathmandu then. Okay. So, um, in terms of people that stay in Nepal, people do study there. Uh, they get a student visa for um, studying Nepali, um, mm -hmm. studying, studying, uh, um, I do have some friends, you know, studying Nepali there and that's how they stay for longer, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Yeah. We, we tried to, uh, go over there a couple of years ago and yeah. really get established and check the boxes and we just couldn't pull it off, but yeah. we wanted to, we want to try and do a full time over there. It just didn't happen. I, okay. I, if, if we had enough money, you can buy into to doing the agency thing, but it's far out of our reach. <laughs> yeah. How how is it in India? If you say that you stay most most of the time in India, how how's the visa, you know, process in India? How long? Can For India, stay? as as an American citizen, you can get a ten year visa. Ooh. Whoa! So <laughs> I have a ten year visa to India. That uh, I think they've done that in India because they want. Um, Indian nationals that are living in the U S to, to come back more. So mm -hmm. come back more often during the year. So <clears throat> I think that's why that exists. And so I, I do have a 10 year visa to India. Cool. That's multiple entry. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. Nice. Fine. Far out. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm curious. Do you have any expeditions lined up if, if COVID sort of, if they start open up and the restrictions sort of get eased, you have any expeditions that are lined up? Any teams that are ready to go? Yes. For right now, we're really planning for the summer of 2021. Mm -hmm. It seems more realistic. Like it's a bit quick for the coming spring, although it may <clears throat> it may work. We'll see. Um, so, well, I should say that's what I've been focused on in the past couple of days. But we do have expeditions planned for for the spring season in in Nepal. Nice. So. Uh, we will see uh, what happens there, and also a, a ski trip to to uh, to the wrong book. So we're going to oh, go yeah. ski uh, Lac Paris in May, right next to Everest, mm. and maybe also do some skiing on the northeast ridge of Everest on some of the lower slopes there. Um, so we don't oh, wow. have an eight thousand meter trip planned for for uh, for the spring season, but. Um, 7,000 meters for sure. Okay. Yeah. So. You've spent a lot of time from west to east in various parts of the Himalayas. Is there a mm -hmm. particular area that captures your imagination? Oh, it's just so diverse. I think that's why I love it. I mean, there's just, you've got, um, it, there's just so many different types of geology across the range uh, and then different cultures. And you have like culture going back up to 5,000, you know, 5,000 years old. And so, um, um, it, it's, it's also, it's also different that I don't really have a favorite, you mm -hmm. know, it, it's, uh, well, it's just so much out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the, an the answer is you have to be there to know what it is, what it's feel like. <laughs> Well, I mean, in terms of, I guess I could uh, list a few, like I really, I think we've already talked about uh, Kashmir yeah. and um, what it's like there. And then Ladakh in Northern India, I really love. Uh, Ladakh is, uh, it's in the rain shadow. So it's this high desert. It's very similar to the Tibetan plateau um, where you have this relatively flat landscape with these at 4,000 meters, mm -hmm. 5,000 meters around there with these 6,000 meter peaks and 7,000 meter peaks jutting out of it that are uh, glaciated on their north faces. And um, it's a really neat spot to go in summer. So I really love that area during summer. Um, and now I'm starting to go to the Karakoram more in which I, it's just 
everyone needs to be, if, if you love mountains, you should go to the Karakoram at least once yeah. in your life. It's just so, it, it's just so jagged and, um, yeah. it, it looks like what I used to draw in like third grade class when mm-hmm. I was drawing mountains. You know, it's, it's just so spectacular, we're, but we're so I'd say the Karakoram's cool. And then what were you going to say, Todd? Uh, I was just saying, we're definitely going to be looking you up for uh, joining you in that yeah. part of the world. So you can That's count awesome. on us okay. coming. Uh, you're, you're talking about that area just recently. I want to pull up a clip because I, I, when I saw this and saw what you're doing over in that area, I thought it was really cool. Let's pull up clip two. Our son, his name is... The uh, Chaintang Plateau runs from mm-hmm. northern India into China's Tibet. It's a flat rolling landscape at about 4,000 meters with 6,000 meter peaks and a couple 7,000 meter peaks, more than a couple, sticking out of that. Uh, Amongst those peaks are nomadic people called the Changpa. Chang means north in Tibetan and Pa means people, so it's people of the north. Fascinating group of people who live from their sheep and goats and also yaks. Uh, They live in yak hair tents and they move from place to place for grass. So they'll graze an area for a few weeks and then move to another area. And that happens throughout the summer months. And then when the long winter comes, uh, the winds of the west, the westerly winds begin in the first weeks of October. Wow, man, that place just looks phenomenal. It looks just so beautiful and tranquil. Really yeah, that's uh, that's nettle soup that he has there. He's been uh, picking nettles. So like they go from those yak hair tents. They have hundreds of sheep and goat, and they go out and graze for the day beneath these giant peaks, uh, and come back. And as they're going throughout the day, they pick the nettles, wow. um, and they make uh, nettle soup. When you say is, nettles, like the the like thorns nettles. <laughs> Like stinging nettles, yeah. When you boil it, it's this really nice. Uh, gets a nice texture. That... Wow. Do what? It gets a it's nice good. texture to it. It softens it up. I hope. It does. Yeah. It's called in Nepali. They call it sisnu. Um, I can't remember what it's called in Tibetan right now, but it's it's really good. Yeah. With yeah. salt. All right. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. Good. Yeah. So that area just looks like. Um, really open and phenomenal place uh-huh. to hang out and so remote like endless and i'm guessing there's no tea houses of anywhere. nothingness like just rocks yeah, it's, and it's wilderness nothing. and like it's uh what i love about ladakh is you can change your plan which is really nice in the himalayas like if you, in nepal you have these very deep valleys right when you go on an expedition you're kind of committed to that valley um <laughs> for the duration. If there's like a weather problem or things aren't in condition, um, it, it, you can kind of get shut down sometimes. Mm-hmm. Whereas in Ladakh, if things aren't quite right with a specific thing you're trying to climb or a peak, you can shift to another area, which mm-hmm. is, uh, I think pretty attractive to a lot of people. Because to, it just, uh, it just rolls that. out of the high plateau. So you, pretty much mm-hmm. you can go, Hey, let's go there. Let's look, let's do that one over there. And go to the other side of the plateau yeah. so to speak i mean wow. you, you, you need a permit but it's nice that it's kind of like uh china but you don't have the um there's a bit more freedom to to move around there um mm-hmm. so the road system's there and you can you can move from um for example oh, i think it was 2016 fall 2016 autumn we went to uh a peak in the the uh, Lahal Himalayas. Uh, we had a big storm. Uh, we got snowed out of that peak. So we jumped in the Jeep. Uh, we moved to the north side of the range and climbed an unclimbed peak or an unclimbed route on another peak right. because, uh, and that was really nice to be able nice. to do that. Um, and everyone um, was able to to get a climb in and not get snowed out of a. Right. Uh, wow. So you've been in Lahal. Uh, we uh, our first training was in uh, Lahal Spiti area in Himachal Pradesh. Uh, awesome. We've been in Manali. Yeah. It's really yeah. an awesome place. Manali is awesome it. place. Yes, and yeah. there were a lot of unclimbed peaks. Uh, actually, one of our um, commence, uh, you know, like final 
training with our uh, Indian instructors uh, was to climb and then climb peak. <laughs> that was a your 19, training 000. climb. Yes. It's a training climb. It's a Woo! training climb. <laughs> yes. So we trained under the Western um, Himalayan Mountaineering Institute in Manali. And man, they were really strict, but they were really good teachers. They were sort of like military ish in background, you know? Like sure. that's how they yep. trained us. We were running in, in boots <laughs> early in the morning and we were doing push ups. Military style. Yes. Doing your morning runs. Definitely. What? And that's how basically the Indian military is trained. They, they were being sent to, to Everest, you know, the high altitude soldiers. That's how they're being cool. trained. Yeah. So they really had a very good discipline. So I, I love cool. I India. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Luke, yeah. You, you're, you're climbing, you're skiing. Do you have, do you f have an area where you feel more accomplished or... Uh, where you, what you prefer more, or is it really more of a symbiotic relationship? They sort of one sort of helps train the other. I, I think they go together quite well in the Himalayas. It's just really nice if there's snow on a slope. Why why walk downhill when you can yeah, ski? <laughs> that's what I'm seeing, <laughs> but, man. The yeah, they they work well together, and definitely have to climb uh, a lot of routes or most routes to. To ski them i mean there's no mm -hmm. there's no infrastructure right. in place otherwise mm -hmm. so um more accomplished um uh, i really think I'm, I'm just getting started um there's a, there's a lot i want to do there still <clears throat> and like i was saying about from decade to decade when things are open and then also um i just uh i don't i feel like i'm just getting started so uh that's kind of how it feels to me i, I don't i don't really feel that, that uh mm -hmm. yeah I'm, I'm really uh it, it's just it's My definitely a lifelong pursuit so yeah yeah, yeah. right on yeah. good on you so the local culture and history seem to draw you to the himalayas yeah. notice that yeah do you there, ever uh reflect on how your expeditions may impact these communities totally yeah i think that um I, I think that it's something to have to be careful with. Like we definitely pack it out, leaving no trace is, is a big part of what we do. So uh, we we, uh, we make a point to, to bring out our waste, mm -hmm. um, stuff that can't, aren't burnable, you know, so we bring out our, our, uh, our tin and, our, and, and other things. Uh, and also I think that um, just respecting local custom so just being aware of subtle things that may not be part of one's culture at home uh, may be a thing there. So, you know, um, for as an example, like never, you never put your feet towards someone else in, in like rural Nepali culture. Um, so li little things like that, that may, yeah. that we may not be aware of from, from back home. Um, so being aware of that and, and, uh, um, making a point to to um do some good as well along the way so uh, the first the first years i was focused on water quality and so we go into schools and i was bringing in water filters and, and talking about um the importance of <clears throat> water quality and that was through waves for water um and which also has funding for for installing wells mm -hmm. um, and doing all kinds of things in rural nepal um, and recently I've been working more on, like in, in Kashmir, I was working on the um, avalanche awareness for rural areas. Right. So as we go doing a bit of, you know, when there's a big storm, it, it's a good day not to be beneath those big drainages as people take their, you know, people are living a pastoral lifestyle. So when they're taking their livestock out to graze, it's a good day to use um, the fodder that's been gathered around the house as opposed to, to going out um, on those big storm days because there have been fatalities, um, avalanche fatalities because of that. And so talking about that some, and uh, currently we're working on a program for uh, doing some, it's kind of like uh, there's some there's outfits already out there doing it, but working with um, doctors to do some, um, outreach work as we go as well. Mm -hmm. So cool. doing some of that work too and bringing some good. So, you know, doing what you love, but helping out along the way. Nice. So, nice. Nice work. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you've been in uh, Himalayas for more than a decade now. Uh, mm-hmm. We have, next week we've got a polar explorer on, Eric Larson. I don't know if you know him. but I've heard uh, his name. Yeah. yeah, he's, anyway, he's he's done the, I think he was the first guy to do the three poles, you know, the North Pole, South Pole, and Everest, Everest. all in one year. Wow. Yeah, pretty phenomenal guy. But one of the things he talks about a lot is what he's seen in the last decade. He, And maybe it's more so in the polar regions, but he talks about he does see a shift in uh, glaciers and, and ice pack mm-hmm. and in climate change. How about you? Have you seen any dramatic changes in the Himalayas in uh, the glaciers or the ice pack? It, the glaciers are melting in the Himalayas. And they're saying if we get two degrees Celsius um, in terms of temperature uh, increase, we'll, we'll see the glaciers gone by 2100 is what they're saying. Um, there are, and what, what you see <clears throat> is like these, uh, there's these lakes forming as the glaciers melt mm-hmm. um, with, and the lakes form because of these ice dams. And when those ice dams break, um, it's called a glacial lake outburst lake, which is currently a concern like on the Imya Glacier, the Island Peak Glacier. Yeah, the Island um, Peak. There's that lake back in there behind Island Peak. That one's... Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there are some of those that are forming. That is a concern. Uh, there is some migration of people out of the Himalayas uh, already who are, aren't, aren't able to... Uh, to graze their animals necessarily. So um, it, it is occurring it, and it will be, but at the same time, uh, you've got, yeah, so all of these glacial valleys are like water towers for like the Indo Gangetic Plain. So everyone living down beneath the Himalayas get their water from the Himalayas. Mm-hmm. And so when those melt out, we're going to it's going to be a serious uh, problem in terms of uh, water. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it it is, it is occurring and it's like on the ground, it's not this like, uh, it's very subtle, but it's, it's, it is happening. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, I, I took off sailing was quite young and you know, that's 25 years ago and I spent, uh, you know, the better half of my life, I don't know the better half, but <laughs> anyway, half of my life on the water. But that's the one thing that I noticed as well, too, was uh, the pollution that I saw, the mm-hmm. dramatic change in pollution yeah. in the last 20 years on coastlines is freaky. I mean, I don't know what's happened, but when I first took off, you know, it was pretty pristine. And, and the United States, we sort of keep it all cleaned up, but the further mm-hmm. I went and the more years that went by, I stepped on some places in land. Like there's a place around Singapore where I stepped on land and the, the plastic bottles and refuse was like walking through powder snow, but not powder snow. It's up past your knees and your hips. Oh, man. Just bizarre. And I've sailed, I've come across places, you know, a thousand miles offshore and it's a garbage pit. And you're like, how, how is this possible? But I really have noticed those things over the years. It's sort of uh, changing, and uh, it's something for sure that it's a growing problem that needs to be addressed in so many different areas. But yeah, certainly, yeah, 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 yeah for I, sure. Yeah. Also, you know, the one thing that I was curious about, Janet and I haven't really been out west. Well, you have, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't spent much time out west. But what's the difference between? Uh, uh, the east and the west i mean you've got you've got sort of the hindu culture and the buddhist culture what's the difference do you find that they they receive you differently or what do you find in the culture in, in western nepal yeah in western nepal it's it's more uh <clears throat> there's not really any tourist infrastructure out there so uh you, you, we're we're camping out behind schools and uh you know, finding fields where we can camp. Um, so it's a different experience that way. It feels like more of a, an expedition, mm-hmm. expedition-esque. Uh, and it, uh, 
in terms of people, um, <clears throat> it, it's it's uh, a mi- it's really interesting in terms of how like it's mostly Buddhist up in the higher Himalayas um, and more Hindu in the Taraya region, the southern belt along uh, the Nepali border. And then as you have those villages in the middle, um, it's really neat. You see, um, like you'll have a temple that has um, Buddhist and Hindu um, relics and Mm -hmm. iconography in the same temple. Right. Um, So they all start to sort of, Co-mingle the same place, the culture which is stuff. really neat yeah. to experience. Um, so that, that that's pretty fascinating to check out uh, on on approach to these peaks, and uh, they speak uh, Doteli, so a different language out there, which is out. I'm, what I'm speaking about in Western Nepal, I mean, it's quite a large place, mm-hmm. but I'm speaking about the Api Saipal area, which yeah. are seven thousand meter peaks over there in that valley. Um, <clears throat> you they're they're speaking doteli and so we don't really know like we're speak we speak the national language the guys i work with and um everyone speaks the national language mm-hmm. in nepal but when they start speaking in their their local Dialect. um language we don't know what they're saying which right. is was which is amazing like to be to come over from from Kathmandu and like even the guys who are who were born in nepal or nepali um they're, they're like this feels like a different country you know, mm, it's wow. pretty cool. Yeah. So like, I, I do love that. So, <clears throat> yeah. So kind of like the same here in the Philippines, you know, we have our sort have of a lot like, of different na- dialects. Yeah. Each sort of island region has quite a few different dialects. Yeah. So. And Janet, <laughs> she understands them. A little bit, but s- some dialects I don't. But yes, uh, we have our sort of like um, national uh, tongue, yes, you say it's Tagalog, but then if you go to other regions, they may have a different dialect, and s- mo- ma- there are many th- dialects <laughs> that I don't know. <laughs> but in general, yes, I I could understand bits and pieces of it. So really cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we yeah. we actually got uh, invited on a uh, climb here. I can't remember four or five years ago. It was to climb the seven highest peaks. In yeah, the seven highest peaks in the Philippines. It's pretty. They have, you know, we've got uh, ten thousand feet, twelve thousand foot. No, we only have t- not even ten thousand. Right at ten thousand. A little short, ten thousand. That's our highest mountain here. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, it's it's cool. Lower than Lukla Airport. Volcano <laughs> climbing, some really amazing climbs, and we got flown around here. And the mission was to. Uh, bring back solar energy into indigenous groups that mm-hmm. sort of work back or live back in these villages around some of these big mountains in the Philippines. And we awesome. went to some really remote areas and went through some really far out ceremonies because they have to, uh, you have to accept and go through a ceremony before you're allowed to climb a lot of these mountains yeah. with some of the indigenous, indigenous people. But a really cool cultural experience for me, <laughs> and I think Janet as well. Yeah, to see so. some of uh, you know her fellow Filipinos, but still had that big communication barrier. I yeah, found. but I think uh, we communicated in one language, is the body language. <laughs> I think it's international. <laughs> so, so look, after so much hard earned time in the Himalayas. Um, what has changed inside you? And if there is something that changed inside you, uh, how do you think this might have, uh, you know, made you different in dealing with your, with life and your relationship in the mountains? How has it changed me? Gosh, I just want to continue what I'm doing. I'm just really, uh, I I really love to, uh, explore and discover. So I just, I want to continue to do that and, and just just learn learn more along the way. I think it's just the knowledge and you know all the experiences that uh, that you have on an expedition. I mean, you have that summit, but it's not really about. I mean, it is. A, I mean, people go because they want to summit a mountain, but it's those what you remember, like the memories you have, is um, you know that person that you speak with that has maybe knowledge of like some plants in a in a little area, or you see uh, you know a uh a langer monkey like 
cruising through the forest and then the next day you're in waist deep snow and the highest mountains on earth is just it's uh mm. it's all those little experiences that you have is what you remember and um how how is it uh how has it changed uh, i just want to continue <laughs> doing what i'm doing yeah i, I really That's love cool. it so if that answers that question yeah but, yeah 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 so i'll sort of add on to that do you have any takeaways being an american you know and i huh? i'm an american as well i took off quite young to travel and i feel that my experience has changed me a bit hopefully for the better <laughs> but uh do you have any takeaways you've learned from the people, the the culture and the spirit in the Himalayas that you can bring back home? Something that you can. Oh, yeah, it's just uh, the uh, there. It's just tremendously inspiring the the people you meet in the Himalayas, just living in these harsh, <laughs> harsh, uh, remote areas, and just with such uh, purpose and joy. Uh, it's just so inspiring. And so, uh, I think it's really just that. Yeah. Yeah. When, when, uh, well, it seems to me that you really connect with the people and I'm guessing that you really work at sort of learning the culture and, uh, the names and the, the language. And at, when I watch, it, watch your videos yeah. and read your articles, it's like, seems like you're really connecting there more than yes. anything else. It's a big part of what you do. And I, I'm guessing you've seen what I've seen as well. Is like they have this thing in the community in the mountains is where they really help each other. Even if the guy comes over the range and he doesn't even know him, he's from another village. If it's pouring, it's you know, dumping snow, you get welcomed in the house. And they don't know you, you know, it's sort of a different thing that we sort of grow up with. It's very different. Yeah. It's like here we would probably, if someone came into our yard, we, we may, uh, you know, <laughs> hey, no what are you doing, buddy? <laughs> or it's like, um, <laughs> there, um, come in for tea. Yeah. Come on in. We're here to well, help. In camp in our yard. <laughs> sit by the stove. Yeah. 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 Lovely, lovely people and a lot to learn from them over there, I think. And, so that's what I really enjoy. With well. your stay there, did you ever experience planting potatoes? Mm. Planting potatoes. With the uh, locals? We did one year. <clears throat> actually, on that Arnico Chuli expedition, we weren't allowed to, we weren't planting, but we were helping with harvest because oh. um, 400 and something years before, some people had gone into the mountains before harvest was finished. A storm had come and destroyed the oh. harvest before they could get it. And so they had written this in the, the books. The books are kept in the monastery uh, with the monks um, because the monks decide when harvest occurs and things. And so we weren't allowed to go into the mountains until the harvest was done. So we helped with the harvest, oh. um, which was uh, which was really neat but i haven't planted have, have yeah. you have you done that with well not janet me. this not is how she paid her way <laughs> up the himalaya well not not Everest. me personal but my teammate yes <laughs> no the reason why i raised that question is that um you know i i know western people are very hard working but nepali people i've never seen so much hard working well they work hard yeah they you work hard to. man like planting potatoes they 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 do it non-stop they only stop for tea like a couple of minutes and then just go on and on and on and it's usually the women who plant because the men uh, usually or go out with the mountain and guide and or yeah. do a porterage you know uh but it's the women and it's the kids that throws the <laughs> it's, it's the women that tills or digs the hole and then the, the other another woman or, or the, the kids, kids throws and shoots the the potato in the hole so oh, it's yeah, just yeah, yeah man it's amazing <clears throat> i'd like to amazing. preface this story a bit janet's team when they were you know they climbed they have two summits like the first summit was the the men in 2006 Six, yeah. and the, the women were in 2007 but you know they were always struggling to fund this expedition yeah. and they were on the mountain. I hear this story the first year and funds were running low. They couldn't get their permits paid or I think they actually got their permits on loan. If you can believe this or not, 
on loan, right? You you pay after the climb. I've never heard of it, but they they have some mission. They have to send half the team's got to go back to the Philippines and fundraise. Where half the team, they said, oh, we'll just save the money, live in the mountains. And they had some of the boys live in the village with yeah. no money and had to pay their way by planting potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, a, a little bit of uh, you know input in there. It's just you know, yeah, we we always run out of money. But at that time, there was a um, I call this uh, civil unrest. So oh. back in two thousand six, there was civil unrest. So um, our guys. Um, our climber, uh, male climbers are already out in the Sulukumbu uh, acclimatizing and the team cannot send them money because there is, you know, everything has stopped. Uh, transaction has stopped, flights has stopped. So uh, there was no solid date of like, okay, when can we resume this? So, you know, the boys have to live and uh, as we say, they have... 2006. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So they have to find a way on how to you know, get a warm bed at night. So in exchange, they have to plant potatoes the whole day just to get a meal in a warm bed. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, it was really a cool and awesome experience. So anyway. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when the Himalayan 500 is complete, um, what will be left behind for others to gain? And how do you see its legacy? I wanted to inspire others to to get to the Himalayas. That's all it is. And I really, I mean, the, the concept of me doing this is just, I'm going, I mean, part of the, part of the thing is to tell the story of skiing in the Himalayas too, because I'm certainly not the first person to go there to ski. You know, people have been skiing in the Himalayas since the, I mean, the farthest back I can find is in the 40s, hmm. 1940s in the central Indian Himalayas, but I, I imagine it's maybe even, even further back. So it's also talking about the history of skiing there and then also of ski mountaineering and, and, uh, and also the, the development of, of ski areas there too, because there are ski areas present. So, um, the goal is just to talk about the massive world of, mm -hmm. There's just so many different ski opportunities there. So the goal will be to tell that story. Okay. So it's not necessarily about me and uh, what I'm doing, but about skiing in the Himalayas. Far out. So nice. The goal. Yeah. So here shortly, you're going to have your finish your holiday in North Carolina and you're back to the Tetons. Uh, mm -hmm. When you get back there, what do you, do you have worked? Are you guiding? What's what's the story? What are you doing? I, I work on the computer. All my work's on the computer. Uh, really getting ready for expeditions for the guide service for next year. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I'll be doing uh, athlete work. So I work for some. I work for Mountain Hardware and some other companies as a ski mountaineer. Mm -hmm. um, so. Part of that is 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 working with design. Uh, we're working on some new some new uh, equipment for ski mountaineering okay. and for backcountry skiing. Cool. And um, the also with a ski company as well, and with a, a company that does uh, a GPS watch, which is Coros Global. Uh, they're a pretty new company that is uh, making a, a pretty solid watch for. Um, documenting training and uh, documenting climbs and, and ski descents, and uh, I'm pretty psyched about yeah, that. Yeah, I so, think I saw I saw really that and I saw that in one of your posts the other day. You were out for a run with that watch, mm -hmm. I think. So, yeah, it is the daily I'm out training um, because of those brands and able to do that. So outside of my guiding work, I am preparing for the, those larger ski projects next summer in the Kirikorum. So uh, that, that's what I'll be doing when I get back. And I have a dog. I have a dog now. Yeah. So, uh, wow. Uh, it's gonna be yeah. hard. It's gonna. It's gonna be hard. To... How does that all work? You got a dog, but you're gonna be there. They're... Yeah. How are you but... gonna do that? It's gonna be hard to go back to the Himalayas. You're gonna fall in love with your dog, and you're gonna yeah. can't leave, honey. Right now. Yeah, he would be with me here right now on the East Coast, but they've shut down. Dogs are not allowed to to fly 
right now. What what but kind of I dog is it? What, what's his name? Yeah, I think the trick is like quarantine is what I've heard. I think for some countries there's like a six month quarantine or something. Wow. For the dog? Like, horrible. Yeah. Well, dog. I think Australia's yeah. got some crazy. Oh wow. Like that, but... What kind of dog is it? He's a husky. Uh, oh. I think he's a rescue. I got him from a, a, a rescue program in the valley, and he is a uh, his name is Wolfie. Wolfie. Wolfie, nice, very suiting. <laughs> do I, do you guys, you guys have pets or? Yeah, you have pets oh yeah, or? we've got our son Himalaya. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Son, he's he's here. This, he's here. We usually have a studio engineer. He's sitting right beside us. Yeah, he's, we have a son uh, Himalaya. His, his name is Himalaya. Yeah. He's sitting here running the studio this oh. morning. We have a couple dogs. We've got uh, two dogs, Marley and Mangy, which we found cool. in the mangrove. We, yeah, they, they're rescue, rescue dogs exactly. as well. We rescued them. And, you know, right outside the front door, when we have our coffee in the morning, we have a school of fish that come visit us, and they, they shoot water on us. They have this weird technique. They actually shoot water onto the deck to try and get your attention to feed them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's For, pretty. It sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow, that's so cool. They're yeah. domesticated, oh, actually. Okay. They're spo- We've domesticated the they're fish. They're spoiled now. <laughs> so whenever we, you know, they, they sense movement, they just like stare at you and just spit at you. It's like, oh, feed me. It's like, feed okay, me. they're yeah, so spoiled. Great. <laughs> so, yeah, we have a few pets. And oh, what oh, but- is Himalaya? He's going to turn 14 a uh, few days' time, actually, yeah, in the 10th. 10th. Yeah. He's gonna turn fourteen. He's big. He's big. He's bigger than both Janet and I. He's uh, <laughs> almost. Six he's getting foot. almost six foot and one hundred and eighty pounds. It's weird. <laughs> We've been uh, working out recently, doing the the gym, the MMA. He and I have been getting into doing yeah. some MMA cool. recently. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's all right. I was curious about your training program. Yeah. What's going on right now? How are you staying fit? How are you getting ready? How are you keeping it together for the mountains next season? What's up? uh trail running do a lot of trail running uh just because it i'm able to keep my heart rate at a consistent um rate uh, for extended period of time and also ski touring and rock climbing yeah. so that's really what i do and it's around 12 15 hours a week uh, mostly in zone one and two which is a, a lower heart rate level and then i'll do intervals one day a week of like sprints and then usually one or maybe two gym sessions a week. Cool. To, uh, oh, okay. To get ready for that. So do you, a lot do of it. It's not very exciting to most people. It's just a lot of running, long mm. mileage, and uh, it does take a lot of time. But yeah, that's what I do. Anyway, uh, so. it's not that far. You know, we just had a guest on about a week ago or two weeks ago. I'm not sure. His name Jamie Ramsey. He <laughs> ran from Vancouver, British Columbia, to Buenos Aires. He's averaging oh. 40 <laughs> kilometers per day. Yeah, 40, oh, yeah. 40 kilometers a day, a day. And he it's 367 Crazy. running days from Vancouver to Buenos Aires. He's he's the he's wow. the the real what do you call it? Um, what is that Forrest guy? Gump? Forrest Gump. <laughs> oh, okay. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was a really great story. Really cool guy. <laughs> so, so go ahead. Do you do any meditation aside from running and the gym and rock climbing? I do. Uh, about half an hour of meditation. Just, oh, uh, cool. Just uh, to, yeah. Do just do your own meditation. Nothing like, you know, you like by the, the books or something like that. Sorry, what, what would you say? I said, it's, it's just your own style of meditation. Nothing like by the books that you have learned or... uh, no it's not really by the books no it's just focusing on the breath really okay yeah but, cool yeah. that's great so um i'm also curious about your himalayan alpine guides um is your team mostly you know americans or you have a local counterpart in nepal or in india whenever you go uh, i work with a crew of four guys uh so two guys are uh tibetans that live in india okay. um and we, we try to stay together year round for expeditions. Um, and then one guy is Sherpa from the Kumbu region below Lukla. And then one guy is from the Manali area. That's okay. kind of the, the core crew. And um, we generally yeah try to stay together um, 
it, when we can, like sometimes, like um, I think that, well, I know, I know that Indians are not allowed to go to Pakistan, so that doesn't mm -hmm. uh, work, but in the rest of the Himalayas, we stay together. Right. So, do, do, they, kind of do they have a chance to go to your country, to U.S., or you're the uh, only one who goes there? I, I go here uh, generally in uh, November, December to, uh, that's kind of the quiet season for the Himalayas. Mm. So that's when it's the driest. There's the least amount of snow and like I was saying in that, that mm -hmm. little video we watched earlier, uh, the westerly winds come in. So November and December aren't, aren't the best months for climbing up high. And so that's really a, a time period for all of us to be home with family and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, get ready for the next season. So, mm. oh, that's good. You know, you know because uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, porters as well and guides you know, they start off like um, meeting um, other people from the Western countries and other countries in the world. And during their the off season in the Himalayas, uh, the the clients, so to speak, became their friends. And and these clients, you know, sponsored them to go to Europe or France or, or, yes, or the United them. States. And that's how they get to travel. And I think that's really very very um, awesome because they also get the chance to. To, to travel and be out in the world, you know, and be really Absolutely. prolific. Yes. Yeah, so, that's yeah we've got some, not, not too many of them get that lucky opportunity, no. but we have some friends that are, uh, have got an agreement now that works really well for them where they spend seasons in the Himalayas and some of them uh, transfer over to the Alps yes. and guide over there. So they're really uh, westernized and educated, but got some real cool stuff going on yeah, yeah 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 absolutely what's going on with that program is is tremendous yeah, yeah the IMGA guide program for for nepal and right uh, to bring that back to the himalayas and and have that level of professionalism is huge so yeah, yeah. it's good cool to see that change hey mm -hmm. luke what a great conversation we're having i want to play one last video clip here before we wrap it up because we're all about bringing ski into the himalaya one more awesome look at that <laughs> Woo. Oh, there's this is this section here. <laughs> That's great. Oh, yeah, this one, this one right here. This looks phenomenal. Wow. Look at that. <laughs> Cool, man. Skiing nice. in the Himalayas, bring it on. <laughs> yeah, totally. That was Langtang. That was two years ago during the deepest winter there in more than 20 years. It was pretty special to fly into Kathmandu that year and see snow on the rim of Kathmandu Valley. And I've never seen that. And oh, people yeah. talking to locals in Kathmandu, they're like, yeah, we, we, we never see snow here in the valley. So that was a pretty unique winter. Of course, it meant a lot of shoveling for a lot of folks, and mm -hmm. we were shoveling out in Lang Tang during that period of skiing. Oh. But, um, yeah, special is, place for wow. sure. Far out. Is it a? I'm curious. Is, it, is there a difference between, uh, you know, um, a mountain, like when you're doing mountain expedition high and skiing high? You know, I I, I can just imagine there's a high, like a Zen, uh, feeling whenever you ski. It's just like running, right? So you, you feel that high and you're in the uh -huh. zone. So are, is there a difference in, in, in trekking and in climbing than in skiing? Well, I, I think it's uh, the feeling of 
of skiing is, is just tremendous. I mean, to, to, to just, uh, to be in a setting like that, experiencing, uh, uh, yeah, to experience the Himalayas and to be skiing snow like that, it, just the whole thing is just, uh, I think it's really, uh, as good as it gets for me, mm. you know, it's just, it, ha it has it all there. And so, uh, Gosh, how would you explain that? Like the physiology behind no. it? Or the... no. <laughs> yeah, I think it. No, the reason is I, I haven't skied. I, I never, you know, I haven't experienced she skiing. She hasn't so skied. She's not I don't skiing. know. But I've seen, yeah. But, you know, I've, I've talked to, to Todd. And I've also, uh, I have instructors uh, in, in New Zealand. And uh, they, they're they really big in skiing as well as there. And they, they describe it as like, it's a zen it's a moment it's tranquility it's it's a solace inside you you know like that high so i i saw some must be good i saw some <laughs> footage of you a few weeks back i think this was recent footage and you were skiing in some pretty light powder pow pow mm -hmm. and i've been lucky i grew up in the cascade so it was a bit heavier and th thicker and i had fewer powder days but i made it over to Colorado and Steamboat Springs a few times when I skied in that and it's hard to explain but it's like skiing in heaven I don't know there, there is a difference in the snow yeah, conditions see, that the powder and changes the, the way it feels I don't I understand find. it so it, yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's definitely something that people should check out yeah going with gravity and and uh you know flowing down a slope in in nice high quality powder snow is uh uh, it's a very special experience yeah. and very different than you know climbing and and going uh you know against gravity but <laughs> yeah it's a gravity yeah. sport and yeah it's it's a lot of fun so people should check it out if they have so cool yeah. all right luke i think we're running out of time here and we're going to wrap it up i want to thank you one for joining us we're really appreciative that you came and joined our show we want to thank you for all the great beta and stuff and information you've given us and uh, we're hoping we can join you one day on an expedition we'd love to come and i and unclimb peep with you so uh, let's stay in touch yeah thank you yeah. i'd be psyched to climb with you guys and ski and and uh yeah let's definitely talk more uh, yeah. Thanks for having me on your show. Oh, thank you. Far out, brother. Thank you. Cool. We really enjoyed your stories and, yeah, the the insights that you shared. Thank you very much for your time. Awesome. Have a good evening, guys. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. okay. See ya.